The lens is a transparent biconvex structure which is placed in between the iris in front and the vitreous chamber behind. It is of utmost importance within the human eye. It transmits and refracts the light and as a matter of fact it actually contributes to about 35% of the refractive power of the eye. The remaining uh, the remaining refraction that is about 65 percent actually comes from the cornea apart from that the human lens also helps in accommodation and also absorbs the harmful uv light of about less than 350 nanometers in wavelength so what is meant by urfakia urfakia simply put is the absence of lens from the eye Sometimes, however, the lens might get subluxated or dislocated from its normal position and in such cases, when there is absence of lens from the pupillary area, that is also referred to as urfakia. Now, let us see what are the causes of urfakia. Based on the various causes, the urfakia can be actually divided into various types. We have surgical urfakia, we have traumatic urfakia, congenital urfakia and post-dislocation urfakia or the optical urfakia. First, let us discuss what is meant by surgical aphakia. Whenever the lens is removed surgically, it leads to a surgical aphakia or absence of lens. Now, this procedure is known as lensectomy. Okay. Now, this is usually done in case of congenital and infantile cataracts, which is uh, which usually requires this lensectomy within about 6 to 18 months of life in order to prevent amblyopia development. Similarly, in pediatric and adult traumatic cases, most of the time, a primary, a primary lensectomy is necessary first to allow for complete healing before we proceed with a secondary procedure of IOL implantation, right? So in most of the trauma cases, the first surgery that is done is just a lensectomy. Apart from that, the surgical aphakia could also be an unintentional complication intraoperatively, for example, in case of a posterior capsular rupture or the PCR. The second type of aphakia is the traumatic aphakia. Now, traumatic aphakia basically occurs after trauma. Sometimes there will be a deep penetrating wound through the cornea and that might cause damage to the lens and to the surrounding lens structure. And sometimes what you will see is the extrusion of the lens through the cornea. Okay, so that leads to traumatic aphakia. Apart from that, post-trauma, very rarely, the lens matter gets absorbed on its own. And there might also be a dislocation of the lens, known as the traumatic dislocation of the lens. Now, have a careful uh, view of these images. So, in the first picture, you can see that there is actually this corneal tear over here. And sometimes, because of this corneal tear, the lens which is inside, obviously, it will become traumatic. It will develop traumatic cataract. But also, because of the pressure changes within the eye, because of of the tear in the cornea what is going to happen is that the lens will actually come out and that is called traumatic extrusion okay in the second picture you can see that the lens is not really sitting behind the iris instead it has come into the anterior chamber now that is called the anterior dislocation of the lens leading to this segment of a fakia apart from that in the second in the third picture you can see that the lens has actually been dislocated within the vitreous cavity and is actually sitting on the retina instead of sitting at its location in the patella fossa right so that is traumatic aphakia coming to the third type of aphakia and that is the congenital aphakia now congenital aphakia means that the lens is absent right from birth okay now this is an abnormality which uh, develops during the fourth or fifth week of the fetal development because this is the time when our lens development takes place okay now here the genes which are involved is the fox e3 gene and the pax 6 gene Apart from that, also there will be sometimes rubella infection that can lead to a development of congenital aphakia. Now, congenital aphakia can be of two types. We can have a primary congenital aphakia or we can have a secondary congenital aphakia. Let us try to understand what is meant by primary congenital aphakia and what is secondary congenital aphakia. In primary congenital aphakia, it basically results from the failed induction of the lens placard and therefore the entire lens is going to be absent. Okay. Now, if you do not understand what exactly is a lens placard and you want to know more about, of, uh, about it in detail, I'm going to put a link in the, comments, uh, in the comment section or maybe in the description box regarding a video which is already present on the development of the human lens on the channel.
So that is your primary congenital aphakia in which the induction of the lens placard is itself absent and therefore the lens is absent. Whereas secondary aphakia is when the lens placard has developed but it gets resorbed for some reasons before birth. So here only the remnants of the lens such as the lens capsule will be present and the entire other parts of the lens would be absent. Now let us talk about the optical aphakia. Now optical aphakia can also be told uh, also be called as the post dislocation aphakia. Here the lens is basically absent from the pupillary area either because of subluxation or dislocation of the lens and this is also known as ectopia lentis. That means the lens is not really present in its real position. It is present in some ectopic position. Okay. Now this can occur secondary to trauma, a very important cause of optical aphakia as we have already seen in the previous uh, some of the pictures. Apart from that, you can also have dislocation post some systemic disorders that can cause weakening of the zonules and ultimately leading to the malposition of the lens. Apart from that, we have various genetic mutations as well, for example, in Marfan syndrome, homocystinuria, wheel march syndrome, all of these can actually lead to dislocation or subluxation of the lens leading to optical aphakia. Now you can see this first picture over here, which actually indicates that there is a superior temporal dislocation of the lens. You can see the stretch zonules over here. So this patient actually has a partial aphakic segment. So this inferior segment will be aphakic and the superior segment is actually having the lens okay this is partial aphakia in a patient with marfan syndrome because of superior temporal dislocation of the lens okay now another thing i would like to tell you is that in marfan syndrome usually you will have a superior subluxation of the lens whereas in case of homocystinuria you will have an inferior subluxation of the lens now sometimes what will happen is that this disease is pro has a progressive nature and the entire lens might actually get dislocated either into the anterior chamber or it can get, dis get dislocated in the posterior chamber. As you can see in the second picture, the lens is now sitting right on top of the retina and the same is seen on an MRI over here. Okay, so you can see the lens sitting on the retina instead of being present somewhere here. Having understood the various causes of aphakia, now let us try to understand the various optics of an aphakic eye. Now, what happens in a normal eye is that we have two uh, we have two structures which are dealing with the refraction. So we have the cornea, which has a power of about 44 diopters, and we have the lens, which has a power of about plus 16 diopters. Okay, so the lens actually is separating the aqueous humor from the vitreous humor. Okay. Now, what exactly happens in an aphakic eye is that the dioptric apparatus of the eye is now changed to a single refractive surface. So, we have just the cornea left which is single-handedly managing the refraction and therefore the power of the eye will also now reduce. So, as you can see over here, initially we had the lens which was contributing to about plus 16 diopters but in an aphakic eye, it's only the cornea which is imparting a power of about plus 44 diopters to the eye. Also, the lens between the aqueous and the vitreous humor is now gone and they have uniform refractive index and they actually act as a single apparatus. Now this actually leads to the various changes in the eye. For example, the focal length of the eyeball. The anterior focal length of the eyeball as you can see is normally about 15.7 millimeters from the anterior corneal surface and from the and the posterior focal length from the anterior corneal surface is about 24.13 millimeters. Right now, however, in aphakia, you can see that the focal lengths are actually going to increase. The anterior focal length now has increased from 15.7 millimeters to 23.2 millimeters, and the posterior focal length has also increased to 31 millimeters. And you can see that the posterior focal point is now forming somewhere behind the eyeball because the length of the eyeball itself is about 24.13 millimeters, right. So what exactly is happening in an aphakic eye is that because the focal point is getting shifted behind the eyeball, the eye is also becoming highly, highly metropic. Okay, so why is it happening? It's happening because the power of the lens is reduced. We have just the cornea present dealing with the refraction. So almost about we have lost about 16 diopters of the power. Obviously, this will vary from patient to patient, but the but an aphakic guy has actually lost a significant amount of its focusing power right now apart from that you can see the focal point has also shifted behind and so therefore these two factors will contribute to the development of hypermetropia in an aphakic eye 
In addition to hypermetropia, there is always some amount of astigmatism in all these cases of aphakia, especially if the patient has a surgical aphakia. Now, what exactly happens uh, is that in these surgeries, usually there will be a corneal or a corneal scleral section or an incision that has been made. Okay, and usually it actually differs from surgery to surgery. Suppose the patient underwent a fake emulsification without any suture, so that becomes a sutureless surgery. So in a sutureless surgery the incision itself will actually flatten the meridian okay the incision alone actually flattens the meridian so for example if we have a phaco emulsification surgery and the incision has been taken in the superior quadrant then post in post surgery there will actually be flattening of the cornea in that superior meridian okay so what exactly is happening the uh, the vertical meridian or the superior inf uh, inferior meridian actually will become flattened out because of the incision which has been taken superiorly in phaco emulsification and the horizontal meridian will now be more steeper and this type of astigmatism is known as against the rule astigmatism okay so at this point i uh, would like to assume that all of you know what is meant by against the rule astigmatism and what is with the rule astigmatism and even if you don't know about it you don't worry i will put a link in the comment section or in the description box for you to refer to that okay so usually a uh, pure incisional surgery where there is no suture placed like in phaco emulsification there will be a against the rule astigmatism if the incision has been made in the superior quadrant okay and this incision uh, this astigmatism is of about 1 to 1.5 diopter however if there is a surgery in which the sutures have been placed sutures usually lead to steepening of the meridians okay so you can remember sutures have an s in it and steepening also has an s in it so sutures lead to steepening and incision leads to flattening okay so in an SICS surgery or an extra capsular surgery if you have put uh, if there were sutures which were placed post surgery then there will be steeping in that meridian for example if you have carried out a superior SICS with suture placement at the end of the surgery it will lead to basically steepening of the vertical meridian compared to the horizontal meridian and this will cause with the rule astigmatism and this astigmatism is usually of the order 1 to 3 diopter okay so this is not a hard and fast tool these examples are basically considering that the patient was emetropic uh, at the beginning of the surgery another problem that the patients with urfakia basically face is that of problem with the near work and this happens because of the loss of accommodation as we know that the lens is basically involved in accommodation that is the ability to increase its curvature or power when dealing with near work now as the lens is gone so is the accommodation and that becomes a major problem in treating uh, in treating urfakia other problems that you see with urfakia is that you have to understand that it can cause complex mechanical and biochemical changes in the vitreous and also in the aqueous humor or in the anterior segment structures. Usually when there's surgical urfakia, intraoperatively there might be a complication known as the posterior capsular rupture where there's a, a discontinuity in the integrity of the posterior capsule and because of that what happens is that you might see the loss of vitreous that means the vitreous which is usually limited in the vitreous humor with, uh, behind the lens might actually find its way through the posterior capsular rupture into the anterior chamber such a vitreous when it moves forward it actually causes some traction on the retina and it can actually lead to retinal detachment as well now this vitreous when it has moved from the vitreous humor it can enter the anterior chamber and as it moves into the anterior chamber it can block your trabecular meshwork leading to the secondary glaucoma and also it can cause damage to the corneal endothelium which is present here which in, which can cause the corneal decompensation okay so definitely changes will occur in the vitreous itself leading to vitreous degeneration and later on because of the traction the patient can actually develop a retinal detachment so these are some long-term complications associated with a fake yeah. Now, what are some of the signs and symptoms that you see in an aphakic patient? Symptoms are very obvious. The patient is definitely going to have defective vision and the vision will be defective both at far as well as near. The far vision is defective because of the high hypermetropia and the accommodation is also affected leading to the defective vision at near. 
Apart from that, as we know that the lens basically can absorb the UV light and also infrared rays. And therefore, since there's absence of lens, excessive entry of UV and infrared rays occur in the, into the eye, leading to a, a, a different types of hues to the image. So if you get a reddish hue to the image, that is known as the erythropsia. And if you see a bluish hue to the image in an aphagic patient, that's called as the synopsia. Now coming to the signs that you see basically in a patient of a fake ear. Now usually these patients, if they have undergone an SS SICS surgery or an extra capsular surgery, there will be a limbal incision as you can see over here, right? Obviously this is an intraoperative picture, but even post-operatively such patients when you invert, uh, when you actually retract the upper eyelid, you might be able to identify a limbal scar or a limbal incision. So this is a cornea, you're going to see incision over here. Uh, assuming that the surgery was carried out from the superior quadrant. Apart from that, the anterior chamber in case of an urfakia is usually a deep anterior chamber. And why does that happen? Usually you have this lens which is sitting between the vitreous cavity and the iris. And when the lens is taken away, as in case of urfakia, what is going to happen is that there is no support to the iris and therefore the iris is basically going to move backwards leading to increased depth of the anterior chamber and therefore in case of urfakia and even in pseudofakia you will have deep anterior chamber okay now apart from that what you see is since there's no support to the iris because of the lens being gone here you are going to see some tremors in the iris as the patient moves his eyeball from left to right position or up and down you're going to observe that there is some tremulous of the iris and this is known as iridodonosis Coming to the other signs that you see in urfakia is the color of pupil. Usually in pseudofakia, when there's an intraocular lens which is present in the eye, uh, when you actually shine light with your torch or when you observe this patient under a slit lamp microscopy, what is going to happen is that you will see a shining reflex that is going to come from the lens. That means the lens is going to shine back at you by reflection at the intraocular lens surface. However, in case of a urfakic patient, there is no eye well present and the pupillary area is actually empty and therefore the color of the pupil will appear to be jet black in color. Apart from that, the number of Purkinje images can also guide you in diagnosis. Uh, the Purkinje images in case of a normal eyeball is uh, in normal eye are basically four in number, whereas in urfakia it is only two in number. Also, in fundus examination, you will observe that there will be a small hypermetropic disc. The reason is because in urfakia, you have high hypermetropia and therefore the disc in these patients also will appear smaller in size. Refraction obviously will reveal high hypermetropia. So this is what I was talking about the Purkinje images. In a normal eye, there are basically about four Purkinje images. The first image comes from the anterior surface of the cornea. The second image comes from the posterior surface of the cornea. The third Purkinje image comes from the anterior surface of the lens. And the fourth comes from the posterior surface of the lens. Now, when you have a fakia, this entire lens is gone. And therefore, the number of Purkinje images that you're going to see are only two. One coming from the anterior surface and the second coming from the posterior surface of the cornea. If you take a look at uh, this, these comparative pictures, in the first picture, you can see that there are actually four Purkinje images, and this is actually a case of pseudofakia. Now, in pseudofakia also, you are going to see four Purkinje images, and the third and the fourth Purkinje image are going to come from the anterior and the posterior surface of the intraocular lens, okay? Now, the second picture is that of an urfakic patient. You can see there's only one Purkinje image over here, which is seen. However, if you actually were to move your slit beam from side to side, you can actually appreciate two Purkinje images in case of urfakia. I'm so sorry, this is urfakia and not fakia, right? So in urfakia, you have two Purkinje images and in case of pseudofakia, we see four Purkinje images. Now that we understand uh, urfakia, we have to now deal with the treatment of urfakia. And the main optical principle behind treating urfakia is to use certain sort of convex lenses of appropriate power so that the image can be formed on the retina. We know that in urfakia, what is happening, there is high hypermetropia and the image is being focused behind the eyeball because of the increase in the uh, focal length of the eye and also because of the decreased power of the eye. And therefore, we have to find ways to supplement 
uh, the eyeball with this ex with this additional power. So there are various modalities of correcting aphakia. We have aphakic spectacles, contact lenses, intraocular lens, and also refractive corneal surgery. And to tell you, the standard of care right now is contact lenses and intraocular lens, and the best one are actually the intraocular lens. However, in this video, we are going to actually um, focus on the disadvantages of using aphakic spectacles because these actually form a very important uh, MCQs and also high yield point for your entrance examinations. So aphakic spectacles were uh, very commonly used for treating aphakia right. in the past and even now when surgery is contraindicated when the patient cannot really wear contact lenses then also spectacles has, uh, can be used for treating the aphakia. Now prescribing aphakic uh, refraction or aphakic glasses is not so easy. Now there is a misconception that goes around that aphakic glasses are just plus 10 convex glasses. Okay, no, that is not true. The prescription actually can vary from patient to patient. It all depends on the previous refractive status of your patient. For example, if there's a patient who is who was already myopic before becoming aphakic, now post aphakia, this patient might need a much lesser power than that of an emetropic aphakic patient. So in such patients, your plus 10 diopter glasses are not going to work. Okay. So therefore, it is advisable that for every aphakic patient, proper refraction is carried out and not just a, a, a common glass is given to everyone. Okay, so we need proper refraction and the refraction should be done for near as well as far. Okay, so not to forget that the, the aphakic patient also have problem with accommodation and therefore a near ad for them is also very, very uh, important. Now, let us first try to enumerate the problems with the aphakic spectacles. The first problem is image magnification. Then we have spherical aberration, chromatic aberrations, limited field of vision, prismatic effects of the glasses, high power glasses, rowing ring scotoma, also known as the jack-in-the-box phenomenon, and of course, the cosmetic problem and the heaviness of the glasses, okay? So now we are going to discuss all these problems one by one. Now let us try to understand the first complication that can actually occur with aphakic spectacles, and that is that of the image magnification. So looking through the aphakic uh, glasses, the image is actually magnified by 33%. That means the image is about one third times larger than the normal image, okay? Also, this higher magnification to the image also results in a better performance or an enhanced performance of the standard visual equity tests. Okay, for example, if there's a patient who's wearing aphakic spectacles and the results are about six by nine on the visual equity testing, Snellen's chart, then this will be equivalent to a six by 12 of an emetropic patient. Also, what happens is that in the first picture, what I, uh, I'm trying to depict over here is that as the image basically moves farther away from the eye, the visual angle that it actually extends on the eye also decreases. And the image which is magnified, it actually, it actually extends a much larger visual angle at the eye. And this basically gives an illusion that that artificially magnified object is closer to the eye than it really is. Okay, And so therefore, this is going to lead to a lot of judgment problems for the patient. So there's a uh, there's a false spatial orientation of the visual objects. The objects will appear to be much more closer to the eye than they really are. And this is happening because of the increased visual angle that is subtended at the eye by the enlarged object or the enlarged images. And therefore, these uh, objects are going to be judged to be nearer than they are leading to um, miss judgment in these aphakic patients adding to their misery right it actually you know takes the patient months of trial and error to figure out the perfect hand-eye coordination the patient is uh, visually uncoordinated he's going to knock and fall often uh, fall also more often so quite a problem right so as we talk about a spectacle magnification, it is very important to understand two important terms and these are spectacle magnification and relative spectacle magnification. So first, let us try to understand what is spectacle magnification. This is a very important MCQ which is asked. So the optical correction of ametropia is actually associated with the change in the size of of the image right at the retina so the ratio between the corrected and the uncorrected image size is known as the spectacle magnification that means suppose you have this man okay and initially he had some problems say he had uh, say he had hypermetropia and the size of the image initially
initially was say x at the retina now you have corrected this patient you have given him the convex glasses and now the size of the image on the retina is y so your spectacle magnification now would be corrected image size by uncorrected image size that is y divided by x okay so i hope that is clear so now let us try to understand what is meant by relative spectacle magnification so actually speaking clinically the relative spectacle magnification is much more useful to us because it actually compares the corrected emetropic image size with an emetropic image size that means a normal patient okay so you are you are actually comparing the corrected image size in the patient to a normal patient with a normal image size so that is called the relative spectacle magnification so in the spectacle magnification you were correct, you were actually comparing the image size in the same patient one image uh, one image size was the corrected image size and the other was the uncorrected image size whereas in the relative spectacle magnification you you actually compare the corrected image size of a patient with the normal image size of a normal person so this relative specific uh, relative spectacle magnification actually is very important and if you actually see in case of a spectacle correction it is about 1.36 and whereas in case of a contact lens the rsm value is about 1.1 Okay. Now this becomes actually important. You can actually compare over here. This is the normal size and this is the size of the image that is going to happen with the contact lens. That is what is going to be achieved with the contact lens. And this is the size of the image that is going to be achieved using the spectacle lens. So if you carefully observe here, the size of the image is maximum with the spectacles and it depicts that the magnification that you achieve with spectacles is the maximum compared to the contact lens and then the intraocular lens. Okay. So the advantage of using a contact lens or the advantage of using an intraocular lens over the spectacles is that these systems whether it is a contact lens or an intraocular lens they will actually become an integral part of the optical system of the eye itself the spectacles are always placed at a distance from the eye whereas the contact lens are going to be sit sitting directly on the surface of the eye the intraocular lens is going to be sitting within the eye right so they're actually becoming an integral part of the optical system of the eye and therefore the magnification that these uh, modalities of treatment offer will be much less compared to what a spectacle gives right so the use of contact lens and intraocular implants will basically reduce the rsm value to 1.1 to 1 for a contact lens the rsm is about 1.1 and for an intraocular lens it is almost unity that means there is no uh, image magnification that occurs another point is spectacles give about 33 percent image magnification and contact lenses basically cause about 10 percent image magnification now Another complication that can happen with a fakia and uh, also with treating a fakia with spectacles is that of anisometropia and anisoconia. So now let us see what are those. Basically, we know that in, in an aphakic eye, there's a total lack of accommodation, right? Apart from that, what is happening is we have this relative spectacle magnification value of about 1.33, because of which the image in an aphakic eye after spectacle correction is going to be about one third larger than the image in the normal eye, right? So this is this will definitely cause a, a difference in the size of the image. The image from one eye, which is aphakic, is going to be much more larger compared to the image in the other eye. This will lead to anisoconia. And because it is anisoconia, it is going to become extremely difficult for the brain to fuse these images and therefore the patient is going to suffer with diplopia okay so there's going to be double trouble uh, with spectacles for the aphakic glasses so i hope that is clear now another point that we must remember is that an isometropia basically means difference in the power between the two eyes right so each one diopter of this difference or each one diopter of an isometropia usually corresponds to approximately one percent difference in the relative magnification between the eye and the visual system can actually compensate for about three percent to five percent of relative magnification whereas when we are talking about aphakia there's actually about 33 percent magnification okay so that is definitely a problem now, so basically when you have a fakia, the patient is going to suffer with anisometropia. Okay, that is difference in the refractive power of the two eyes. And when you're going to treat the fakia with spectacles, what is going to happen? There is going to be difference in the magnification. And because of that, there is going to be anisoconia. And because of this anisoconia, the patient is going to land up with diplopia and difficulty in fusion of these images. 
Now, another problem that occurs with using these opaque spectacles is the spherical and chromatic aberration. So we'll try to understand these one by one. First, let us see what is meant by the chromatic aberration. So failure of the lens to focus all the light to one single point uh, is known as the chromatic aberration. Now, this basically occurs because of the changing refractive index of the lens with the wavelength of the light. So as you can see over here, the red light which is passing through the lens is actually coming at a focus at a much farther away point compared to the blue light or if, if if there was no chromatic aberration all these lights irrespective of their wavelengths will come to focus at one single point but that really doesn't happen the refractive index of the transparent material is actually decreasing with the increasing wavelength so what i mean to say is that we know that if you remember this acronym whip gear the red light actually has the maximum wavelength and what happens is that as the wavelength of the light increases the refractive index of the material through which it is passing for it will basically go down right and as the refractive index goes down the bending ability of that uh, uh, material for that light ray will also go down and therefore you can see that the red light doesn't bend as much as the blue light which has a shorter wavelength and therefore the blue light is going to come at a focus much more earlier point compared to the red light right so that is what is known as your chromatic aberration now what uh, what really happens because of chromatic aberration is that the chromatic aberration is going to manifest itself as this fringes of color along uh, around, along the boundaries that separate the dark and bright parts of the images so if you look at this this is a bird but to a patient who is a faking and wearing a fake spectacles so he will suffer with chromatic aberration and the border of this bird is going to look as if this there are fringes of colored uh, bands along the border right so that is known as this uh, chromatic aberration so all these aberrations are quite pronounced with higher power glasses and since in Ophakia we are using really high power plus uh, lenses uh, therefore we have these spherical aberrations and chromatic aberrations now the question is what is meant by spherical aberrations now if you would carefully observe here here also what is happening the light rays that are striking a spherical surface in this case this lens okay and the light rays which are actually present at the ends of the lens that is off center so there are some rays which are present uh, which are passing through the center of the lens these are called the axial rays and then there are rays which are present on the other side on the eccentric portions of the peripheral portion of the lens and those are called the paraxial rays now if you would see the central rays or the axial rays basically are coming to focus at a point whereas the paraxial rays are basically bending too much right so the paraxial rays are actually coming at focus at different points right so this is called as the spherical aberration okay and this is called as a posterior spherical aberration if if the peripheral rays are bent too much and that means they come to focus at a point ahead of the normal focus and it is called a negative spherical aberration if the rays will come to focus behind normal focal point that means if the rays are bending to less right so that is called as a positive or a negative spherical aberration now when we are talking about the earthquake glasses usually what we are going to see is a positive spherical aberration so i hope that is clear okay so this is one problem that occurs with the uh, earthquake glasses now the question is how does it really manifest itself now spherical aberrations they manifest in a patient who has aphakia as distortion so they are going to see distortion of all the objects which are present in the periphery now as a result of the spherical aberration which are induced by the strong convex lenses used in aphakic glasses the straight lines are actually going to appear as if they are curved Okay, so this is the distortion that I'm talking about in case of the Urfiki uh, glasses. Um, as a matter of fact, for example, a newly corrected Urfiki uh, person who passes through a doorway, the doorway will actually appear to him as if it is curved inwards and it will, as if there's a very little narrow space for the person to travel through it, right? So definitely, uh, I can understand you will also say that it's, it's fine, you know, it is just an illusion, it's not reality. But definitely, it can be very, very disturbing for a new awake patient, right? Another effect that can occur or another problem that can occur uh, in aphakic place patients because of spherical aberrations and because of the distortion is the pincushion effect. Okay, so usually there are different ways in which an image can get distorted. Usually, as I told you that in case of an aphakic patient or in case of very high plus lenses or convex lenses, the 
for example this door example for uh, as a matter of fact we took what was happening was the door would appear as if it's bent inwards right the same thing happens is that the distortion this sort of distortion in which the straight lines are actually bent inwards is known as the pin cushion distortion okay it looks as if uh, there's a pin cushion right so it resembles the shape of the pin cushion and therefore it is called a pin cushion effect or pin cushion distortion and this is seen with high power convex lenses whereas when you talk about the concave lenses suppose you have a, a patient who is using who has to use a really high power concave prescription which is a negative prescription then in those cases, cases the patient will observe uh, what is known as a barrel distortion now in barrel distortion the lines will be distorted in such a way that they will appear to be curved towards the outside okay so that is called a barrel distortion now it is called barrel distortion because it resembles a barrel right so this is a very high yield point that remember that in a convex lens in a high power convex lens and also in a fake correction with spectacles you are going to see a pin cushion effect whereas in a concave lens high power concave lens we will see what is known as the barrel shape distortion now the question is is there a way the patient can actually prevent uh, suffering from these distortion yes there is only if he can actually keep his head straight looking always through the optical center of the lens not really you know uh, moving the rays along the paraxial part so what i mean to say is as i told you that if this is a lens the axial rays will focus on the focal point whereas the paraxial rays will focus either behind or in front of the focal point so only if the patient could actually keep his head straight all throughout looking through this optical center of the spectacles okay and not move his eyes only use his head movements keeping his eyes motion less only then maybe the distortion might not appear but definitely this is too much to ask from the patient now another problem that we deal with the high power glasses and also with our fake glasses because they are high power convex lenses is the prismatic effect of the lens okay so what is meant by prismatic effect we know that prisms basically have this property that whenever light rays pass through the prism what is going to happen is that the light rays will basically bend towards the base of the prism and the image gets shifted towards the apex now if you carefully observe the concave lens is actually a uh, a fusion of two prisms which are stacked at their apexes that means the two uh, the concave lens is basically made up of two base out prisms or base um, yeah base out prisms whereas the convex lens are actually made up of two prisms with their bases together right so definitely since the lenses are made up of these prisms there will be prismatic effect so what really happens is that in a case of a convex lens and definitely in case of a higher power convex lens this is going to be seen more that the rays of light which are incident upon the lenses outside the axial zone that is the outside uh, the rays which are present in the paraxial zone or in the peripheral part of the lens they are going to be deviated towards they are going to be deviated inwards okay this is what happened because you see the apex and the rays are bent where they are bent towards the base of the prism right so a convex lens is acting as a prism like this that means the bases are towards each other and therefore when the rays pass like this they are going to bend towards the base of the prism and therefore in a convex lens the rays will bend towards the axial zone whereas in case of a concave lens opposite happens and the rays of light which are falling on the peripheral portion of the lens will actually be bending away from the axis right so this is known as the prismatic effect and this prismatic effect is going to be much larger at the end of the lens and it basically increases towards the periphery of the lens and it is seen in case of ophakia and also seen in case of the high myopic glasses right now that we understand what is meant by prismatic effect we can understand what is meant by scotoma and why do we see a ring scotoma in case of ophakia now the light which is falling at the edge of the lens will definitely be bending because of prismatic effect and sometimes also because of the spherical aberrations right now because of that what happens is that not all the light rays are going to enter inside the pupil the light rays which are coming from the paraxial rays that means of the periphery these are going to be bent and um, ahead of the focal lens and therefore they're not even going to enter the pupil and therefore they'll not even be seen so this is going to lead to the development of scotoma and as the lens or as the edge of the lens is present all around so what i mean to say this is just a cross section that i've drawn but actually if this is the eye the lens is also going to be circular like this and you actually have the lens edge all throughout 360 degrees and therefore we are also going to see a scotoma at 360 degrees and this is called as the ring scotoma 
right? So the ring scotoma is actually known as the robbing ring scotoma. It is called robbing because the scotoma also keeps on shifting its position as the patient moves his eyeballs from left to right or up and down. Okay, so it moves with the eyeball and therefore it is called as a robbing ring scotoma. The term robbing ring scotoma was suggested by Welsh and it occurs because of the prismatic effect occurring at the periphery of the strong lens, giving, to, giving rise to this ring of blindness at the central field. Okay, the scotoma is usually about 15 degrees. Okay, so the width of this is about 15 degrees and it is usually situated about 55 to 65 degrees from the central uh, fixation. Now, let us try to understand another phenomena which is called as the jack in the box phenomena. The diagram over here depicts the ring scotoma. So, as you can see, this is a patient who is looking straight ahead wearing an Ophiki glasses. And at the edge of the lens, what is happening is because of the prismatic effect, there is going to be a creation of a ring scotoma, right? Now, if an object of interest appears somewhere, some, uh, somewhere here, what is going to happen? The patient is going to try to look towards this object. So the patient is going to rotate the eyeball like this. And as the patient rotates his eyeball towards the object, what is going to happen? The, the scotoma is also going to shift in its position because of the shift in the position of the lens. And in this case, the scotoma is actually going to move in the opposite direction that is from A to B position. And as that happens, what is seen is now the object is now falling in the area of the scotoma and therefore the object is going to disappear again. So this diagram will make it even more clearer. So you can see the first picture. This is a patient who is looking straight ahead at 0 degrees, okay, and this is the convex lens which is there and you have a scotoma at say about 50 degrees to 65 degrees, right. Now if an object appears over here, the patient would want to look at the object and therefore the patient will shift his position of gaze in, uh, by rotating the eyeball towards that heart and as the patient actually shifts his eyeball, what is going to happen, the lens is also going to shift and also the position of scotoma is going to shift. The scotoma is going to move in the opposite direction and now it will be present uh, in the area of 30 degrees to 45 degrees and as that happens what is happening the object is now falling within the area of scotoma and therefore again the patient will not be able to uh, appreciate the object right so this is what is actually happening when the eye basically is moving the blindness ring along with it that is the rowing the scotoma is also moving along with the eye so that the object is appearing and disappearing just like a jack in the box and therefore this is known as the jack in the box phenomena okay so it's very important to know that this problem arises only in the intermediate distances and for example when the pa when the patient is actually in a room the area of the clear vision will actually be surrounded by a ring of fog and whenever the object basically falls in that region of scotoma the patient would not be able to appreciate those objects right so after understanding the jack-in-the-box phenomena another thing another problem with urfakia is the heaviness of the urfakia glasses so these are high powered glasses high powered convex glasses they are quite heavy and the problem is that they keep on slipping down the patient's nose and therefore they also keep on altering the effective power of the lens right and when we talk about the convex lenses moving a convex glass away from the nose actually increases the power of the lens and so by some patients actually use this to their advantage to gain some sort of artificial accommodation that means for example if this is a patient okay and the patient is actually wearing about plus 10 diopters and after some time, if the patient is having some difficulty in near vision, such patients actually learn on their own to move their glasses down to uh, away from their eyes or maybe slip their glasses onto their noses. Now, as that happens, the glass basically moves away from the eyeball. And as the glass basically moves away from the eyeball, what is seen is that the power of the lens will basically increase and this increased power of the lens will basically help in gaining some amount of accommodation in these patients right because if you would remember from the video on accommodation accommodation is nothing but it is basically an ability of the lens to gain some extra amount of power right to gain some extra power and by moving the convex lenses away from the eyeballs the patient actually is gaining that artificial accommodation now the question is, is there a way we can actually decrease the weight of the earthquake glasses? Yes, we can. We can either use plastics as the materials for the frames, but the problem is that they easily scratch. 
Another means of reducing the lens weight and thickness is by the use of lenticular form glasses. So the lenticular form glasses basically have this central portion in which the power resides and the peripheral portion of the lens basically is a plain carrier lens uh, which does not really harbor the power of the lens. Okay, so it just acts as a carrier. The problem with the lenticular lens is that since the power of the lens is situated only in the central part of the lenticular lens, the field of vision is also reduced in case of a lenticular lens. Okay, so uh, when I talk about the glass selection, first very important thing is that you have to choose your frame uh, very carefully. The frame should not be too thick. The frame should not be too heavy. Also, you should try to not choose a very large frame. So whenever a large frame is used and more so you're giving the patient a very thick lens, the lens is going to become more thicker in the center and such a large frame will become more heavier and possibly quite harder also for the patient to tolerate. Okay. At the same time, you have to also avoid rimless or semi rimless frames because then there will be no support to that thick lens. And these are actually your lenticular glasses. So lenticular glasses, if you see, the power is situated only in the center part of the lens and the peripheral part of the lens basically act as a carrier lens. Okay. So now since they appear like the fried eggs, they're also known as the fried egg lenses. And the problem with the lenticular glasses, although they decrease the heaviness of the glasses, they make it lighter. The problem is that they have a very reduced field of view. Uh, field of view. Now, whenever you are prescribing these patients, it's very important to remember that there's actually an absence of the crystalline lens. And since our crystalline lens was associated with absorption of the UV rays, these patients are more prone to UV damage and therefore UV protection is must in these spectacles. Now, since we are dealing with high power uh, fake kick glasses, the vertex distance and even the pantoscopic tilt, uh, any misalignment or even minor variation in these two parameters is going to actually cause um, inaccurate refractive correction in these problems, right? So over here, you can see that the pantopic slit, uh, the pantoscopic tilt angle is nothing but the tilting of the lens basically with respect to the horizontal axis. This tilt is usually done to make the lenses more comfortable for the patient. And uh, the distance between the front of the cornea and the back surface of the lens is known as the vertex distance. So all those, all these two parameters, basically the pantoscopic tilt angle and the back vertex distance are going to control how the earthquake glasses work. And even a minor variation and some, uh, in these parameters is going to uh, lead to a lot of problems in earthquake patients. So with this, we actually come to the end of the video. I hope it was useful. I hope you could actually understand the problems which an earthquake patient face with these spectacles. Obviously, the contact lenses and IOLs have their advantages and disadvantages. We shall be discussing them in another video. Till then, thank you and have a nice day.